How are you guys doing today? Welcome to another class in Theory of Algorithms. Today we're going to talk about network flows and we're going to break this down into what we have for input, what the problem is. We're going to talk a little bit about what these graphs might look like, their applications, when you would use a problem like this. And it's a pretty cool way to actually solve it. And I guess let's jump right into it. So. Let's imagine that we have a graph, and if you remember, graphs are a bunch of nodes and edges that connect them together. Typically with weighted values between them, get into more detail about that in a little bit, where um, each edge has a capacity. Remember we talked about the weighted value? That would actually be the uh, capacity. We have a source node, which we're going to call S. So if you ever see me say S throughout this, we're talking about where the input is coming in from. And you're going to hear the term sync, or sync node, or you might just see me reference that as T. That is where the, um, the flow needs to end at. That's where the exit is. So we have a problem where what is the maximum flow that we can push through this graph while respecting all of its capacity? Interesting problem, but think about it from the terms of like what we could use this for in a real world situation. Think about, um, I guess the first one that comes to mind is plumbing. You know, you've got so much water coming down the water, the main water line. Each pipe at a certain point maybe can only hold so much capacity. But we need to see how much we can actually get here to the end. So how much water can we push through in a grid or a graph like this? And then how much, you know, what pressure are we going to get on the way out? Uh, let's think about some other things. Maybe communication networks. So bandwidth, for example. Got a ton of bandwidth coming in. We're constrained by certain things. You know, maybe the graph has certain pipes that are less or certain pipes that are more. And what can we push through? And there are some complicated things where you can actually have backflow, which we'll talk about, which means maybe data will actually be able to cycle back and forth between them but if we've got 100 megabits of download speed here and we're feeding this input through but yet we're constrained to potentially a maximum of like 25 here on the graph we're not fully utilizing the input here so it can allow you to kind of predict maybe in a housing net, housing division how much bandwidth you can actually get through the entire graph all right, so, oh, I guess another thing would be um, shipping. So, like, if we were taking and um, looking at figuring out the most cost-effective way to ship goods and how they would actually flow, flow through a graph like this, maybe between the two, two sets of factories. So we've got, you know, maybe factory A and factory B. How can we actually send and what amount can we send out to the sync node? All right, so I guess another thing to point out is actually a pretty cool um, thing because there's a variety of linear programming problems that arise. And in practice, it can be modeled with uh, network flow problems. So let's see here. I guess the first thing that we need to do is when we look at a problem set, you know, you may not automatically see it as a network flow problem. So we're going to try to get good at understanding when it actually goes into something that we can model as a network flow problem. For example, shipping may not be obvious that it's a network flow problem. So I guess the recommendation is to first construct a linear programming model and compare it with the linear program for a minimum cost flow which we'll talk about here in a little bit, on a directed graph. So we're going to think about a few different cases here. One case is, what if all the costs on my graph are identical? There may be, and actually there are, I'll just tell you there are, um, faster, maybe arguably simpler algorithms to calculate those if all items are identical. Um, What if we have multiple sources 
that water lines are probably a perfect example too. Maybe we feed water in from a lake or we feed a lot of water in from um, external sources that we bring in from other cities. What if we had multiple inputs? This is another thing we should probably just think about. What if the graph can actually support multiple materials in each one of these networks and possibly even has a different capacity depending on the material flowing through it? And let's see here. Um, I guess the next thing we're going to jump into is there really are two major types that we're going to talk about. And as I erase this, I'm going to write those out so you have them. So the first one is called augmenting path. And the second one is called preflow push methods. So these basically repeatedly, make sure I spell repeatedly correctly, find a path of positive capacity from S to T. Remember what we said those were source to sink. And these push flows from one vertex to another, ignoring until the end the constraint. that the inflow must equal the outflow at each vertex. These basically will end up proving a little bit faster um, because multiple paths can be decided at the same time. So there are a number of implementations that we're going to talk about. And we'll only jump into a couple of them in more detail. But hopefully you got a concept of when you'd want to use these, the two major types that you probably need to be familiar with. So then we're going to talk about some implementations. Okay, so this stuff might might come off a little techy, but we'll get in we'll get into it a little bit more detail. So the highest performing code available for solving maximum flow in, in graphs is um, PRF. So it's developed in C language by a fellow named Cherkovsky and Goldberg. They report being able to solve more than 250,000 vertices, which vertices is another word for nodes, in two minutes on a Spark 10 workstation, for whatever that means, right? The highest performance for solving min cost max flow. So what is the minimum cost max flow? Um, is a CS algorithm and it's capable of solving over 30,000 verts on a Spark 2 workstation. You can Google both of those. I don't know. You know, there's probably implementations out there you could pull in and just use. But if you Google both of those, you can um, find, you know, I was looking the other day, you can find some some cool resources that you can use for non-commercial use. All right, so then the pre-flow push method, there is an implementation by a fellow named Edward Rothberg. And it took him there a second to test a graph of 500 nodes and 4,000 edges. So that means nodes had very, you know, almost a, what would that be? eight to one connection points with 500 nodes and 4,000 edges. Pretty complex graph. And when that got increased to uh, 5,000 nodes and 40,000 edges, it took a little over an hour. So still pretty, uh, pretty 
quick, but at the scheme of things, we don't really want to wait an hour for those type of things typically. We're going to be working with much smaller problems. All right, so then another one is an implementation of 11 network flow variants in C, including the old Dinic and um, Karzenov, I don't even know how to say his name. Um, so I'll just write that out there so I don't. So this guy here, so Karzenov. So this is Dinic and Karzenov. Um, which were, this is the Dinic and Karzenov algorithm, which was created by Richard Anderson and, let me try to spell this right too. Got those backwards, it's J-O-A-O. -O. So Tubal, and I apologize if I'm tearing up their names, but, and it took two seconds to run 8,000 verts and 12,000 edges. And if you remember, with the Rothberg algorithm, it took over an hour to run 5,000 nodes with 40,000 edges. So, pretty efficient implementation there. So, let's do some practice problems, and that way we can see this visually and how it works. So, bear with me as I set up these graphs. I'll try to do it as quickly as possible. And if it ends up taking me too long, I will chop them out so we know. So of course we're going to start with an S over here and remember our S is where the feed is actually getting fed into. We're going to have a node here and you will hear me call it nodes but um, it seems like vert, vertices is used just as common so you can almost think of those interchangeably. Alright this is going to be A this is down here going to be B. This right here is going to be D. And this right here is going to be T. And if you remember, T is our sink, so that's where we're going. We're going to have a node here called E. And we're going to have a node here called C. So let's put our points in here. So, um, and also another thing with water lines to think about. Uh, you know, think about networks. We can send things especially in like a fiber connection, we could actually have data going down and back at the same time. With water pressure, you know, like we're feeding water down a pipe, you're typically going to have water flowing one direction. So in this graph, we're going to use this as a single direction graph. And this is going to have some values on it. And if I get all of these correct, my arrow is going to be the direction that water or whatever we want to pretend is going through this graph is flowing. And I put together this example that I'm drawing. So, but my handwriting is pretty messy. Hopefully I copied this all over correctly. And then this here looks like I drew a two there, which is interesting. And then we've got a 13 here. Nope, just a 3. And then we have 10 here. And then we have an 8 here. Now you just double check this. So we have 8, 6, 5, 6, 10, 3, 2, 10, 8, 4, okay. Um, so one thing that I want to point out real quick is that we can't lose, let's pretend these are pipes, it's just easier to think about it that way. So whatever water we feed in here has to get here. So the number that is fed in here has to be what we pull out of here. We have no leaks, right? We're not losing water anywhere in the middle. So we can't just have that go away. Very important to remember. So there's a theory of theorem that will make this a little bit easier. Um, but before we do that, let's talk about, you know, just manually going through here. All right, so 
we are going to start by assuming so like if we were to go here for example we can send eight this way and six this way so at this point we've got a max of 14 that's the absolute max we can send through there and then now that we have eight we would have eight at the a node so we fed in 16 here and I don't even know if 16 is the right answer we're going to figure that out here in a second um, yeah okay and then here for example we can do now four or five and we're gonna send that eight same eight down through the four and five but now we we're actually have nine extra at this point so in this scenario our max flow so we can send four here that same four so let's just do it this way so we've got eight here we're continuing let me get a different color this will make it a lot easier as we run through this and so we've, if I find mistakes that I'm doing along the way we can definitely fix it all right so we only have these two Interesting. All right, so let's say that we send, we have eight up here. We're gonna use all eight of those. Okay, and we're gonna send six and we're gonna use all six of those. So when we get to this point, one direction that we could go is we could say, we're gonna send all six this way. So let's just start this out by doing it this way, right? And really, I don't know why I'm putting that two arrows there, but send in all six there. But when we get to this point, we now have, I can't remember which direction this, this one line goes. This line goes like this. So we get here, for example, and we can only absorb five. So we now know at this point that we can't send all six this way. So we're gonna send five because two plus three so we're going to send five here, or two here. So we're going to use all of that capacity. We're going to send three here. So we're going to use all that capacity. And we're going to send that additional one here, which means we actually have a nine more that we could actually send here. One thing to also keep in mind is that this three is going to be flowing this same direction here. So we're actually going to end up with a, with like a value of four that needs to get piped up here. So we're going to have four go this way. So we've got two going down. So we filled this line. We're halfway using that line. One thing to also point out here is that since we're feeding eight up this way, we can't really, we can't really feed any more down, right? If we fed any more down, we'd be oversaturating this line. But there's also the possibility that we, what we would have to do in that situation is we would match up the four up here for sure. So we want to utilize this. And did I have a connection there? I did have a connection there. I forgot a line. That's why I was getting thrown off here. So we're going to send four up there. All right, perfect. So we're sending four down. So we actually have a little bit of capacity left on this line. We get here, we find this line is saturated, this line is saturated, and we can send all four of these back up. So now we've got four and four combining here at this D, which equals eight. So we're gonna be sending eight down through here, okay? So what do we have here at the end? We're sending um, three and one, so we're sending four, we're sending two, and we're sending eight. So we end up with 14. 14 total, and how much did we feed in? We fed in 14. So hopefully that makes a lot of, a little bit of sense there. Um, another way that actually is kind of interesting is that there is a theorem that if we cut across 
Let me see here if I can figure this out, how to explain this the best way. But there's a theorem that if you slice like right through the middle of the chart across the minimum part, that will e equal your maximum flow. So we got lucky here that we were able to feed in 14 based on these two. There may be cases where this number ends up being less than what the overall capacity is, so you get a lot of underused, or maybe even the opposite. So I think instead of like trying to fully explain, let me just give you a couple scenarios. So let's say that we were to make a slice right here, and I am going across that 3, which means I'm hitting the 10. So let's add up these lines, 10 plus 3, 13 plus 2, 15 plus another 10, that's 25, right? Uh, let's say we just slice one like right here, for example. We end up with 10 plus 2 plus 8, that's 20. So that's smaller, so we're getting closer to our prediction. What if we send one right here through the middle, okay? Um, and actually, a better way to actually do that is because I can't actually slice through the node. Uh, my line is a little bit crooked. We actually want to slice through all the edges, not an actual vertices. So let's say, let's say we slice right here. Easier to read, okay? So we have 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 10. Again, this is 9, 19, 25 again. So we end up with another 25. And what happens if we slice right here? So there we got 8 plus 6, we end up with 14. There is a theory that if you can find the minimum cut in a graph like this, you can get the maximum flow. And we kind of just proved that in this scenario by the way that we presented this problem. Hopefully you understand a simple case now. So let's talk about the case where we have multiple inputs. Okay, so what I mean by that is, let's say that we have an A node, and we have a B node, and let's see, you know what, I probably don't need to go through the whole thing, but I'll give you a kind of a quick, so here's a node, and then how did I draw that over there, here's a node, maybe these go down across here, like that, and this is like this, and this is like this, this is like that, with it going down. I don't even know. The one value that does matter is um, this one. So this is going to be a 4. This is going to be a 3. And let's just make this a 6, for example. Yeah, let's do that. And then there's a bunch of other nodes over here, okay? And it comes out at an end, which we call our T. Which I also will show you if there's multiple X's as well, too. But let's start with this part. So we know that A and B can both be fed into. How do we, what do we do in this situation when we start running around some of these network flow algorithms that we're dealing with? A trick that you can use is you add a new node. So let's just make a new node and we're going to call this one S. We're going to direct them in. What do you think the value of B is? So if we look over here, we just want to make this identical to everything that B feeds into. In this example, we make this 4. So now our algorithm ends up working. And remember, this actually works with multiple. We could have 4, we could have 5, we could have any number of input nodes. A is a little bit tricky, and this is why I gave you this example. We've got A here, and it's got two edges with two different capacities. We've got a 6 and a 3. So we just add those together, this feed ends up being 9. Because we know once we get to A, it can feed out 9. We know once we get to B, we can feed out 4. Same basic principle on the tail end, too, that I'll give you an example of. So let's pretend that we got a bunch of graphs over here. And, you know, maybe it comes to... Maybe three, three exit points. You know, maybe there's, maybe there's even, you know, multiple nodes that feed into it or whatnot. Uh, let me find a good example. 
So we've got, yeah, there's that. We basically, all we would really need to do in this situation, and again, this matters which way this is flowing here. I'll say this is three, and this is five, this is two, and this is four. We add a new node, we'll call that T, and we build them together. The one thing we don't want to do is allow any less. So we know this, this value will now be 3 with it directed that way. We know at this node, the value is actually 7. So, you know, into that part, we can actually have a line of 7 there. Because we, um, we know that that exit, this would be the exit, can take a capacity of 7 into it. And here, this would be 4. So that makes your algorithms work no matter how many inputs or how many exit outputs you actually have. Alright guys, hopefully that gives you a good overview on uh, network flows. We can get into a little bit more complexity when we start talking about backflows and coming back through graphs.